What costs $300,000 but allows you to figure out that Connor Mant supplies 5% more force to the ground with his right leg than his left when he's running? This treadmill here is one of the pieces of equipment we have in the lab that allows us to do just that. Today we'll take a look at the equipment that we use in our biomechanics lab, give you a little summary of some of the articles we've produced over the years using that equipment, and then I'll finish with a little explanation of what we've measured and found on Connor Mance and whether that's something that we should try to correct or perhaps leave alone the way it is. First, I'd like to introduce you to Manny and Quinn. These are our drafting mannequins that we just got so we can do a test on the effects of air resistance. One of my favorite pieces of equipment in this lab is this treadmill that we have here. This is able to measure forces in three dimensions so we can get vertical force working on the body, the propulsion, the braking, and any side-to-side -side forces that might be going on. It's a high-powered treadmill. It can go really close to four-minute mile pace. It can incline to 28% grade and also run in reverse. And it's so powerful that even fast downhill running, we're still able to have the belt maintain its speed and feel more like natural running, as if we were just over ground. When we're interested in measuring how much energy someone uses, we use this COSMED device, which allows the runners to breathe in room air, but the air that they breathe out gets sampled into this measurement chamber back here, where we can check how much air they're breathing out and the quantity of oxygen and carbon dioxide that are in it. With that information, we're able to figure out how much energy they're using to run or maintain whatever speed they're going. At a few places around the lab, we have 13 of these infrared cameras that track reflective markers that we place on people. And recently, we've also received these smaller cameras that are high-speed video cameras that go back to the big computer and allow us to track people's motion without needing to put reflective markers on. One of the studies that we're just about to begin is with our wind tunnel here. We're still finalizing the design of it, but you can see the general idea. We have multiple fans in there. Some of you may not be able to see, but there's two really large fans, this one in the front, one down low, and we're guiding the air through to this person um, who will actually be running here. And we keep the door open and have a good flow of air coming through the lab where we're able to find out how much energy it takes to run on a treadmill with no wind going on a treadmill where the fan speed would match the speed of the treadmill, which would be similar to running outdoors. And then we can increase or decrease the fan speed from there to simulate a headwind or a tailwind. We'll learn some things about how much energy it takes to run certain speeds with certain winds. We're also gonna measure the forces with this treadmill and the motion of the person to see if there's any adjustments the person makes in how they apply force to the ground and how they move when there is a headwind or a tailwind or zero airflow, like running indoors on a treadmill. One other part we'll include in that study will also be drafting. That's why we have Manny and Quinn here. We'll set them up in front of the treadmill with the fans a little further back. And as the air comes by, we'll have somebody running on the treadmill behind our mannequins and see how much that affects the airflow and the energy cost as they run behind. Something that I've been really excited about lately is our ability to measure how foam is compressed. We've got this device here where that tiny little black end is a magnetic sensor. We send a little voltage in it through this that powers the sensor. And then how close a magnet is to it will change the voltage that gets received back. So we have some magnets under the insoles of the shoe, and then these get taped on the bottom of the shoe under the midfoot and the heel, and we're able to see how close the insole is to the ground or to the bottom of the shoe, where we can find out, well, it's starting around 40 millimeters, squashes down to 32 millimeters or whatever it might be, and we can match the timing of the compression and rebound of the shoe with the force that we're getting from the treadmill. The first study that I got to be a part of through the entire process from start to finish was when I was in graduate school at Oregon State University. I was working with Jerry Smith, who was my professor there. 
He spent a lot of time looking at winter sports like cross-country skiing and speed skating. He actually got to go to the Nagano Olympics and do some analysis of the speed skaters there. He also had a big interest in running mechanics though. So the thesis or dissertation project that I did while I was there was on stride length and distance running. A lot of people asked me through the years, should I be increasing or decreasing my stride rate? Is 180 the number of steps per minute? What should be right for me or should I be doing something else? So we set up a study where we measured oxygen uptake while people ran at some speed that was determined by their own abilities. And as they ran the pace that was selected for them, we measured their stride rate along with their oxygen uptake. Then we used a metronome to have them match different stride rates above and below what their naturally preferred one was. We were able to take a look at the results and find when they went away from their preferred stride length, they used more energy to run. We'd fit this smooth curve through the data to find out what the minimum value would be. And for everyone we tested, they were really, really close to their most economical stride length and rate those go together at a certain speed, and the preferred. Then we had them run for a long time. Uh, at the end of a race, there's often talk among coaches and athletes of, uh, is our stride changing as we get near the end? Are we overstriding, understriding, or what? And we observed that a lot of our subjects, around half of them, ended up taking strides that were noticeably longer uh, so a, a lower rate, even though the speed was maintained. And we did the same test at the end of this fatiguing run. They ran for an hour at 80% of their VO2 max, which is a challenging run even for a well-trained runner. So at the end, even if their preferred stride length had changed, their most economical had shifted with it. So what we learned from that is the body has some abilities built into it that lets them know, here's the stride length and rate that is perfect for you at this given speed, if you're caring about economy mainly. And if you get tired and your body's in a different state, that stride rate and length might change, and there's a new one, but your body still realizes, here's the adjustment to make if we want to have the best running economy possible for us. For quite a few years, I've been able to go out to the U.S. Championships or Olympic Trials and do measurements on the steeplechase. We take the water jump and then one of the other barriers and look at their technique, do certain measurements of how fast they're approaching, how fast they're leaving, the angles of the body, how high they're clearing above the barrier, and so on. And we can take those results and put them into a very large spreadsheet now with all the years we've done and answer questions like how do athletes change as they go from the first lap into the seventh lap? What do the more successful athletes do? The ones that lose less speed as they go through the obstacles, what are their movements that make them uh, better at getting through these? So this year was an exciting one. We had a little trouble at barrier number three on the second lap. You can see Kenny here uh, having some issues as he tries to adjust because of someone falling in front of him. Uh, ended up a very exciting race. I'd encourage you to take a look at that on uh, YouTube or wherever you can find it and see the end outcome of that one. Uh, let me just show you what the water jump looks like also. Here's how we set up our camera to get the measurements we need for the water jump. And we do actually have more frames than that, but just jumping through so you can see what things look like. We get things like where they're landing, the angle of the knee as they push off. You can see some big differences if you look right here, almost a fully extended knee. And then look at hip number 12 there, very different story. So there's quite a variety that we see on the movement patterns people have, which makes it really interesting to look at this event and try to statistically figure out what can make someone more successful in the steeplechase. In recent years, some of the most exciting research for me that we've been involved in is with super shoes. 
Here is the Endorphin Pro 3, which we found some really good success with compared to our control shoes, a more traditional racing shoe. The original study we worked on was with the Vaporfly back in 2017, where we replicated the 4% study and found around 3% and got excited of these shoes really work. 3 or 4% difference in running economy is a huge result in terms of what that means to what, how we can perform. The recent work we're doing is focusing on what the shape of the shoe does to economy and the type of foam that's used, the stiffness of the shoe. We're also looking at a range of speeds and distances of runs. So we're trying to figure out as we progress through a marathon, what happens? Are we still getting a three or 4% difference or does it get better or worse? We wanna understand some things about muscle damage and how that could be affected based on wearing more cushioned shoes like these are. And we're also looking at walking. We're in our first testing, which isn't into the full study yet, but we're seeing some real benefits to walking in super shoes in terms of the economy of movement, using less energy to walk at any given speed, which could have some great implications when we consider people coming back from an injury or a surgery or any kind of medical reason why speed of walking may be limited due to some energy issues or recovering from a uh, heart attack, getting back into exercise with a super shoe on, less strain on the heart for the speed that we're walking. So there's a lot of interesting things we're looking at in the future with footwear. One of the main things to think about when we look at sprinters and distance runners is the purpose of what they're trying to accomplish. The sprinter looking for speed and power, the distance runner looking for economy. And there's some different needs that each runner has for that. A few years ago, a couple of my grad students did a study where they looked at sprinters compared to distance runners technique, and another one where they looked at sprinters, middle distance runners, and distance runners in terms of the forces they apply to the ground and how they move. Let's take a look at some of the results of those. The results you see here show some of the differences that we get between distance runners and sprinters when they're running maximum speeds. When they're going equal speeds as each other, there are still some noticeable differences that we observe. Now the main difference that we think about with sprinters is that they leave the ground without the knee fully extended. That's different than the distance runner, but that allows them to get to the swing phase with a more flexed knee, which means they can swing the leg through faster and get a higher knee drive, which means they can hit the ground with a greater force and one of the best things to predict what someone's top speed will be is their ability to produce large vertical forces as they hit the ground. That keeps them on the ground for a very short time and leads to a greater top speed. When we looked at sprinters, middle distance runners, and distance runners, here's four of the curves that we were interested in there. You'll notice that the solid black line is the distance runners and the middle distance runners and sprinters are more similar than the distance runners are. So we usually see a result of distance runners being their own group, middle distance and sprinters have the similar movement patterns that they like, but the middle distance runner would have a bit more capacity for endurance. Something that's very important to realize though is even though we see group differences there, we shouldn't think there's sprinters movements and there are distance runner movements. We all have times where we need to use both of those. The 400 meter runner does need some endurance to be able to handle the uh, demands of that race. And the distance runners have times when they need to be putting in their maximum speed they're capable of for the state that their body's in. When we're in the finishing kick, there's not really a concern of how much energy am I conserving by moving differently for the last 50 meters. We just want maximum speed. So there's more of a spectrum of going from distance mechanics through sprint mechanics and not just deciding here's what we want for an entire race. Here we have the original data from when we were looking at Connor Mance. We've placed 36 reflective markers on his body and we have 13 cameras that could see from a different view what those markers look like. Those combined are able to create this 3D model. You can see we have forces coming up from the treadmill. We have 
the markers tracked in three dimensions so we can figure out exactly how his body is positioned. After using the software that's called Vicom Nexus, we go into this program called Visual 3D to get the data that we actually care about, or at least in the format that it's easier to visualize and place some numbers that will be beneficial to us. So on the left, we see the skeleton model of his lower body. On the right, we're looking at the vertical force. Each time he hits the ground, the force builds up to a peak right in the middle of the step and drops back down, and then he's in the air again, and then the next foot hits. Now, as we go to certain places of this video, if we go right here, that's the right foot hitting the ground. You can see the peak force is a lot higher than when his left foot hits the ground. And that seems to occur every single step, high and then low, all the way through the measurements we did. Turns out that Connor has about 5% more force when his right foot hits the ground compared to his left. Now, the question would be, should we change anything there? What we've observed is there's often different reasons why you might see a asymmetry in how much force someone applies to the ground on each step. You see that in other things like how much flexion of the knee occurs or hip flexion. Any measurement we look at, we often see a difference between left and right sides. When it gets more than about 3%, we start wondering why is that going on and is it something we should be trying to change? So with Connor, we're trying to determine that right now. So nothing has been intentionally focused on with changing the forces, but we want to know answers like, is it because skeletal structure is different be between left and right sides? If so, we probably shouldn't mess with this, or we're going to put some forces in places where we may end up causing some problems rather than improving economy or top speed or anything else related to performance. Now, if it's a muscle imbalance, there may be something we're interested in trying to change there. We're not intentionally going to change the form, have him move differently, but we would work on that muscle imbalance through some strength and conditioning, and then the technique would likely change itself. So whenever you observe something that's different between one person and another, or between left and right sides on the same person, before just trying to fix that, then make sure you realize what's causing the difference before you start deciding whether something should be done about it or not. Now, whether anything changes with Connor's form between now and the Olympic trials is a little less relevant to me at this point. I just hope that he gets as fit as he can and is ready to really get out and perform well that day. We've got some great athletes in the Olympic trials this year fighting for those top three spots. And I'm really excited for the ones that are here in our training group in Provo. But the more of the other athletes that I get to meet out there, the more I just grow to love the sport and the people that are in it more and more. Many of the athletes that often take a bit of heat in the media, when I actually meet them and get to know them a bit, I just get more and more excited for those that do make the team, whether they're BYU alumni or coming from somewhere else.